since we're on the topic of uh, the war, it doesn't seem to be anywhere close to, you know, how is this going to play out? You know, the, the Russian mindset when it comes to leadership is you've you got to understand Russia has never had a, a single democratic transition of power. People don't expect uh, to have democracy. And the Russian attitude to, to the leader, whether it was the Tsar or the secretary of the communist, general secretary of the Communist Party or now president, no one expects these people to really be accountable democratically. Uh, the, the leader of the country is seen in Russia to this day, you know, s somewhat as being anointed from above. They are appointed by God, really. And if you have a good leader, then you are blessed. And if you have a bad leader, it's something to endure. And so things like war, they're not really seen as, you know, we elected the wrong guy and now he's done the wrong thing and at the next election we have an opportunity to change that. It's seen more as, well, this is a period of time when we have this strong leader in Vladimir Putin who stabilized the country in the 90s. He generally has a lot of credit in the bank with ordinary Russians because he stabilized the country after the chaos uh, that we saw. Um, and now, well, look, war has come, you know, we have to endure. That, that will be a lot of the mentality around that. Whether people are happy about it, again, as I say, that's really something that's very difficult to gauge. But of course, the longer the war goes on, the more war fatigue there will be. We saw this in, uh, this is a big part of why the Soviet Union started to go downhill is, uh, involvement in places like Afghanistan where you saw uh, that you know Russia or the Soviet Union wasn't achieving its goals but there were a lot of people who were uh, who were suffering as a result of being involved and the the, the scale of the war in Russia uh, the war in Ukraine rather now is such that a lot of casualties uh, a lot of chaos going on the Russian troops are not very well supplied uh, that so the message is getting back that rather than, than being this triumphant triumphant war effort, actually Russian soldiers, as they've always been, are being thrown into the meat grinder without being properly supported, led by idiot generals, etc. This is kind of the narrative now, including from people who support the war and who actually want the war to be more aggressive. They are now very upset about what's happening because they're seeing that the Russian soldiers don't have enough ammunition, the artillery isn't as effective because they don't, they have a shortage of shells and so on. Um, in terms of how it plays out, nobody really knows because the, the moment we're recording this l late March, um, what we're waiting for is uh, that part of the world, Eastern Europe, during late spring is, uh, they, they call it Rasputitsa, which is when there's a lot of rain and there's a lot of mud and that means that you can't really attack effectively with tanks and armored personnel carriers, etc. So what has been happening in, in recent months is Russia has been throwing everything it has at this tiny little town called Bakhmut uh, in, in eastern Ukraine. And they've been throwing uh, a lot of infantry at it in these frontal assaults against fortified Ukrainian positions. Both sides are taking very heavy casualties. Uh, and I think the reason that it's happening isn't so much that this is some kind of great military strategy, but rather it's a political idea, which is we need to free up as much of these two eastern regions that they call the Donbass. Um, and if, if we can be seen to have liberated them, at least we have something to sell to our people. Um, they haven't been as successful in that as they would have wished. And now what we have to see is what happens in April, because uh, there will be almost certainly, both sides are talking about it, uh, the Ukrainians have spent this time training up large forces in the West, in Britain and other places, using Western tanks and armored personnel carriers and other equipment. And the purpose of that, as I understand it, is to have a counteroffensive once this mud season is over, in order to see if they can take back some of their territory. And I think Everything now depends on how that goes. Will the Ukrainians be able to be effective in pushing Russian forces further out? If you remember, at the beginning of the war, Russia almost had control of the entirety of eastern and central Ukraine, everything right. to the east of the central line. Ukrainians succeeded in pushing them out of almost all of that, and now it remains to be seen whether the counteroffensive is going to be successful. And that's when I think you're going to see how the next stage of that unfolds. You know, you must be put in this unique position uh, that people almost like come to you for advice when it comes to what's really happening. We can only rely on the mainstream uh, media from the West. 
Uh, so maybe they say that, oh, Russia is almost done, but we were just wondering, is that actually true? No, no, Russia is not almost done. No, and this is what people should be clear about. Look, I've been very clear in that my own view is Russia was wrong to invade. I think what Russia is doing there is immoral. Uh, no doubt a huge number of war crimes have been committed. We actually had a guy on our show, that, an interview we haven't released, who's uh, he's more of like a, a trauma guy. He works with that. And he was over in Ukraine and he talks about, you know, the, the, the amount of sexual uh, violence that was committed against the, the civilian population by Russian troops is just off the charts. And so, you know, what Russia is doing is terrible, but that does not mean that we should engage in some kind of wishful thinking and pretend, you know, Russia is on the brink of collapse. That's not true. Um, Russia historically has a tremendous ability to absorb casualties. Historically, Russia is able to absorb huge numbers of its soldiers being killed and maimed without really having much domestic unrest. Uh, and that is for the reasons that we talked about earlier, which is, you know, war, well, you know, we just got to tolerate it, we got to endure it. The ability to suffer is almost like a Russian superpower uh, in some ways, sadly. I don't know if you're aware of this period of Russian history, but just before the Soviet Union was invaded by Nazi Germany in June 1941, uh, actually the Soviet Union had been fighting what they call the Winter War with Finland. And this was a war in which the Soviet Union invaded Finland, a tiny country. My great-grandfather actually fought in that war on the Soviet side. Uh, and they took hundreds of thousands of casualties for this tiny little country because the Finns fought so bravely. Actually, the sniper, they call him the White Death, uh, the sniper in the entire history of military conflict. Uh, who has the highest kill count is this Finnish guy who I think didn't even have optics. He had iron sights on his crappy little wooden rifle. And he, he is responsible for like hundreds and hundreds of enemy kills. And so that war was a war in which the Soviet Union had huge numbers of casualties, but still was able to, to get some kind of victory, you could say, in that Finland had to give up part of its territory. But what they did do is they achieved sovereignty and independence and Finland is still an independent country to this day, as you know. And I think that will almost certainly be, and I've been saying this from day one, at least in the best case scenario for Ukraine, what happens with them. They need to defend their country, defend their territory to a point where Russia basically gets tired of fighting. And at that point they can say, look, you've taken Crimea, and Crimea is very important to Russia for strategic reasons because it's their way of projecting naval power into the Black Sea. It's very, very important to Russia. They, I don't think they would give it up for almost anything. You know, Ukraine is in the middle of a war effort, right? When you're fighting a war, you have to go, we're going to get our land back, everything is Ukraine, we have to fight. And I understand that. And I, I was speaking to somebody the other day who literally, this guy, who's like an IT consultant. He's not some guy who's, you know, got huge muscles or whatever. He's just a normal guy, drove his family to the border with Poland, dropped them off, kissed his daughters, kissed his wife, waved goodbye and went to the front line. Right. This is what ordinary Ukrainians are doing. They're standing up for their country. They're saying, you know, family, you go, you be safe. I'm going to go to the front line to defend my country. That's what's happening. And I think that's what they need to do. And of course, because of that, the narrative in Ukraine now is, you know, we're going to get everything back and whatever. But I think the truth of it is long term, the likely outcome will be they have to concede some territory. But what they need to get in exchange is long term security. And that means membership of NATO or I'm afraid to say, you know, speaking to you, I understand the trauma for the Korean people of the of the split between South Korea and North Korea and having this D DMZ in the middle and, and all of the terrible things that come with that families being split and all of that. That may be one of the ways that this ends up is some kind of some kind of protection for Ukraine so that at least they can't be invaded again. That's what they need, because if, if we have what we had in 2014, which is, oh, OK, you know, let Russia have some more land, it will just come back again and this will never be resolved. In your opinion, what is the likelihood that we'll achieve that sort of a compromise without, you know, Russia just resorting to nukes? It's very important before I say what I'm about to say, that we all recognize that we have not been as close 
to a nuclear conflict as we are now for a very long time. Yeah. I think we should all acknowledge that, right? Because you see in the Black Sea, Russian jets bumping into American drones and yeah. crashing them into the, the ocean. Uh, I don't know if you would have followed this, but to, to, to a large extent, they don't even bother reporting this in the mainstream media anymore. It's very common now for American and Russian jets to fly next to each other and give each other the finger, like, like in Top Gun. Oh, really? Yeah, this is happening all the time. Russian naval ship, uh, Russian, uh, some kind of destroyer, I think, chased off an American submarine from the coast of Japan recently. Like all of this is happening all the time. So we are not in a good place as the world. We are closer to nuclear conflict than we have been for a long time. That does not mean we're close to nuclear conflict. Right. This is the important distinction and people, this nuance sometimes get lost. People think that, you know, if we're even a tiny little bit closer, that means we should do everything possible to immediately alleviate this. And of course, we don't want to be going down that path. On the other hand, do you allow countries with nuclear weapons to invade whoever they want? Because that, to me, does not set a good precedent. Right. 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 And so there is always this trade-off of how do we manage this carefully. Now, from my perspective, as I look at Russia now, what is being said in Russia now, what people are doing in Russia now, the way that Putin is talking about things, I actually think they have dialed back the nuclear rhetoric a lot since the war started. Initially, what I think they were worried about is NATO actually getting physically involved. And so Putin was always saying, you know, we will defend ourselves with any means necessary and whatever. He kept talking about the nuclear thing. Doesn't really talk about it now. And I think one of the reasons is using nuclear weapons for Russia uh, would be a complete uh, dead end and would actually be terrible, first of all, for them from many different perspectives. Number one, we, we, we see that Russia, you know, has some help from China at the moment. China would not go along with Russia using nuclear weapons, that they wouldn't remain allies with Russia. India has been kind of neutral. India wouldn't be neutral if a country was dropping nukes all over the place, right? Uh, the response from the Western, uh, the Western allies of Ukraine and the Western international community would be so much stronger than it has been if Russia used nuclear weapons. And of course, from a narrative perspective, if your entire narrative is Ukraine is Russia, these are Russian people, we must liberate them. Well, mm. if that's your narrative, why are you then dropping nukes on them? Right. That, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, and so from, from a purely strategic perspective, um, it makes absolutely no sense for Russia to be, nuclear, to be using nuclear weapons. It would be a complete dead end. I think they know it. And so a lot of the rhetoric is simply about attempting to scare people in the West uh, in terms of providing support. But we have seen, if you look at the actual trajectory of the last year, you know, people said, well, we can't give the Ukrainians heavy weapons. We can't give them artillery. Well, then they gave them a bit of artillery. Russia did nothing. So they gave them more artillery. Russia did nothing. Then they were like, well, we can't possibly give them anti-missile systems so they can defend themselves from Russian missile attacks, right? That would be escalation. They gave them missiles. What happened? Nothing. Then they said, we can't give them armored personnel carriers. That would be too much. Now they have armored personnel carriers. Then we're like, we can't give them tanks. Now the, the Ukrainians are training with Abram tanks and Challenger 2 tanks and Leopard 2 tanks from Germany. And they are about to be deployed in the conflict. You know, there are people who feel the West shouldn't be involved. There are people who feel the West should have been involved more and earlier. I actually think, generally speaking, the West has played it about right in that we give a little bit and we see what happens. We give a little bit. And so Russia never can say, oh, now you've gone too far because it's like, what? We gave them 20 armored personnel carriers and that's your red line. That's a bit. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Um, so I think people are right to be concerned that Russia and the United States are in a more hostile posture towards each other than they've been for a long time. However, we have to recognize that that is not just down to us. Russia has a part to play in this. We can't control this uh, to, to a large extent. And you can't allow a country to use its nuclear arsenal to bully the entire world into allowing them to invade other countries. That's where we are from my perspective. I don't think it's in Russia's interest or in Putin's interest to be using nuclear weapons. I don't think he would do, do unless his life was personally in danger. 
But the reason we should still be concerned about it is, you know, escalation isn't all about, uh, you know, people sat down and planned stuff. You know, someone shoots out a drone, someone gets pissed off, uh, a Russian jet gets, you know, you know, crashes because it's crashed into a drone. The pilot dies and suddenly we've got ourselves an international incident and things can spiral out of control. So we've got to be very careful about things like that. And I think, you know, screaming and shouting about how the West needs to be more involved. We actually need to dial down the rhetoric and just on the lowdown continue to provide the Ukrainians with what they need to push Russian forces out of Ukraine. I think that would be a much smarter way of doing it. Instead of running around bragging how many weapons we've given them and you know how much we've escalated the situation.